It's a big call to send two of our most senior cabinet members to the United States, forcing them into quarantine when they get back. Does this show how serious this meeting is? It does. I mean, this is a US election year, so it's an important time to be talking to people in the United States. It's a time when there's deepening strategic competition between the US and China, and when the US has embarked on a new policy towards China that is much more forward-leaning. So I think it's really important that the two ministers have made the effort of going to the United States. Nothing replaces that person-to-person -person diplomacy, and one of the tragic impacts of the coronavirus pandemic is that we're seeing much less of it around the world. And the discussion of these freedom of navigation movements in the South China Sea, which is inevitably going to be a major topic in these discussions, shows just how tense things are getting very close to home. Yeah, look, this is something that a lot of us would have liked to see from the United States long ago, particularly in 2016, when the UN's tribunal ruled that China's actions in asserting these claims were illegal. But we're getting it now. It's better late than never. The US is clearly taking a more forward-leaning stance on how it deals with China in the South China Sea, and it wants allies like Australia to play a part. We've been part of US naval activities in that region for some time. We conduct our own defence force activities, and it's long been suggested that we should be joining US freedom of navigation patrols or conducting our own, and that's been supported by people on different sides of the political fence, particularly um, Ambassador Kim Beasley when he was in Washington. And if we look at what's happening domestically in the United States, we know that uh, coronavirus has been pretty out of control there. And these protests in Texas, interesting for a couple of reasons. We're looking at Texas potentially becoming a purple state, looking less likely to be a Republican stronghold in the polling that we have coming to hand at the moment. But also these protests, a man shot dead. Yeah, more extraordinary scenes from the United States. And, you know, on the one hand, you're seeing protesters showing no regard for public health restrictions, no regard for property, and in some cases, no regard for the direction of law enforcement. On the other side, you're seeing some very crude enforcement tactics from including some federal groups that don't normally do crowd control of protests, Bureau of Prison SWAT teams and Border Patrol groups. So there's escalation on both sides, and you're seeing some tragic consequences of that. Of course, the president making the point that he won't let law and order go by the wayside, even if it won't be enforced by democratic mayors or governors. And democratic mayors and governors making the point that they don't want uh, unknown and unidentified, in some cases, federal agents operating on their streets. Texas, the, the governor there, is losing enormous amounts of approval because of the way he's handled these uh, last few weeks and how he's responded to the coronavirus. So the Democrats sniffing an opportunity potentially in that state. And if we, I mean, these protests, the man who was shot was shot by some another civilian and he was brandishing an AK-47, which is actually legally allowed in this kind of context. It's hard for most Australians to wrap their head around that idea. Staggering. I mean, if you look at what we saw in Kentucky last week, where you had hundreds and hundreds of uh, black clad Black Lives Matters militia uh, packing automatic weapons marching in file down the main street and, and awaiting them were far-right militia in combat gear, the likes of which you normally only see in a war zone. It's extraordinary that the fact that, you know, it doesn't boil over more often and you don't see more clashes between opposing groups carrying semi-automatic weapons is quite an extraordinary thing. I think particularly for us in a country where we don't normally see weapons, they're very confronting scenes. And at this time, with the Trump administration approach, we can see they're really up against it in that there's 50 different states that all act like their own countries at this point, and some are much more out of control than others. At this point, they seem to be pivoting much more towards that focus on international affairs, and you can see this from the pretty extraordinary speech by Mike Pompeo. Yeah, Mike Pompeo is the latest in a series of headmark speeches by members of the Trump administration re positioning themselves on China. And Mike Pompeo's rhetoric, pretty extraordinary. He talked about China becoming the Frankenstein that Nixon feared it might become when he opened engagement back in the late 1970s. Uh, he talked about the need to build an alliance of democracies, to build re reciprocity into engagement with China. He said that the administration's new approach on China is to distrust and verify because, uh, as he's learned through his own experience in, uh, on the east-west Berlin border, um, communists lie. Uh, very forward-leaning language from him, 
call for American allies to get engaged. Uh, what he actually wants China to do is not clear. He's pushing back and calling out China's inappropriate behaviour, which is very welcome. Uh, but we also know that the, his own president has greenlighted that behaviour on occasions. From uh, Bolton's book, we know that the president told Xi Jinping effectively that it was OK for him to uh, roll out erosion of freedoms in Hong Kong and OK for him to continue what he was doing with the Uyghur population in West China. So we're seeing a much more forthright US policy here, but whether the president actually believes it and whether the president will actually prosecute it, that is the unknown ingredient.